Okay, we're good to go. So, welcome back. We've been spending most of the semester so far talking about computational patterns or motifs or dwarfs, Ooh. things like dense linear algebra and eventually FFTs haven't gotten there yet, but most big applications use many of them. And then the question is, how do you compose all of these different computational patterns we've learned about? And it turns out there are a lot of patterns at that level, too standard ways of composing all these things to get good parallel programs, and my colleague Kurt Koitzer is an expert in how to do that, and he'll be today's guest lecturer. Great. So I don't need to spend a lot of time on motivating this. Uh, I presume you're all in this class because you think parallelism is really important, and I think the only nuance I'd like to add here, if you've been focusing more at the high end of this with GPUs with 16 cores, uh, or uh, looking at kind of Tylera style multiprocessors or, or with 64 cores or clusters, is that even your basic cell phone now has uh, multi cores inside of it. So, um, one way or another, you'll be parallel programming for the rest of your life. So, I'd like to start out by my perspective on what doesn't work in doing uh, parallel programming. And so, uh, a common approach is you take your code, you have good performance programming practice, you profile it. If in the profile it's not fast enough, then at that point, your first line of defense is to go in and start teasing out more parallel threads from that code. So you do that a bit, you go back, recode, run it, profile it, it's not fast enough, you just keep going in there and you know, you have a lot of time spent at the whiteboard, knee slapping, oh, just look, oh gosh, we could, we could do this four way, mm -hmm. fork, fork here, join there and so forth. And then if on a good day it's fast enough, you ship it. So here's an a observation that uh, there are lots of failures. And lots of failures, not just that, boy, you know, we had 16 processors and we only got a 3.5x speed up. No, lots of failures of the form. We had 16 processors and the multi-threaded version runs slower than the sequential. And this is a true life example. This is one of my my grad students, I, I'm afraid he's embarrassed every year when I, when I put up his first year project of trying to do thread programming where his sixth threaded version only ran a little slower than, than the sequential version. Some of the intermediate versions like the fourth thread was, was even slower than that, uh, but all of them were, were uniformly slower. And this is, this is, this is real, real code and this is real, real reasonably expert programming. So. If we look at you know, what, what's wrong with that approach, um, I think all we need to do is think about what is this person thinking of when they recode with threads? How many of you have done this kind of just brute force thread, thread oriented programming? A few of you, right? So see if you agree with this is the kind of thing in your head. So you got a lot of things going on there. Most of all, and, and I, maybe this is a UML sequence diagram, I think this epitomizes it the best. Most of all, you're thinking about how am I synchronizing all these different threads over critical resources or critical regions of the code. And it's very complicated, and we as humans don't do it very well. And uh, one of our colleagues here in Corey has written, I think, a really you know, cogent paper about exactly the problems that with the, the, the problem of threads. So what I'd like to do in this lecture is present an alternative and give some of the pieces of the problem and as well as a solution. So I'd like to actually start back from a direction that I don't think you spend very much time talking about in this class, which is, is object-oriented programming. And I don't know, I still remember fondly my very first programs, and uh, I think that, that they are kind of, if we use building as analogy, probably well uh, thought of as just kind of like a, a backyard doghouse style, you know, kind of scrap materials tacked together, a little bit of general sense of how put together, but there was really very little modeling what I was doing, very simple process and simple tools. And this is, again, this is, these are not my slides, these are Grady Booch, kind of one of the great gurus of object-oriented programming, his slides. Then in time we've come to figure out how to build something on the order of a kind of residential house, uh, uh, individual unit for, for a family, say. And there's, there's some modeling, there's a well-defined object-oriented progress, prog process, uh, such as the rational user process, which I think Grady Butch was behind, and there's some power tools. But the dream, of course, is, um, again, from Grady Butch, is to be able to do something like these, these great skyscrapers uh, that, we, that we see in, in New York with, you know, five times the span of the Pantheon, three times the height of Kieps, and so forth, which is going to require significant advances in materials and advances in analysis. 
Okay. That's kind of the object-oriented view of the world. Now, um, the question I, I you know, I, I have taught this. I have presented exactly the slides I just showed you in Software Engineering CS169 here, quite with fervor, eye contact with the audience. This is what we should all be aspiring to do. And I have to say, it probably took about 10 years of that before one day I woke up and go, wait a minute, is a building, really, or is a program really like a building? So I'd like for you to kind of maybe spawn a background process right now to uh, uh, think about, you know, is, 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 is a program really like a building? Or more importantly, how is software not like a building? Okay, so if we look at object-oriented programming, I mean, it, it brought us a lot, right? Those, you're all too young to remember, you know, when Dijkstra's article, you know, go-to is considered dangerous, but Jim and I remember that, and, and, and Jim and I took it to heart. Object-oriented programmers focused on program modularity, data locality, some notion of architectural styles, which I'll talk about in a moment, design patterns. How many of you have looked at the Gang of Four book? by Gamma and, and so forth. Well, I encourage you all to take a look at that. These are, these are the, that's kind of the Bible of object-oriented programming. But object-oriented programming missed a lot. It neglected any notion of application con concurrency. More generally, it didn't look at the computations you were doing at all. In object-oriented programming, there was very little discussion of, okay, now that you've got everything modular, just what computation are you doing in those classes, okay? And there was, of course, uh, predating parallelism, uh, or at least popular parallelism, there was little discussion of parallel implementations. So, um, nevertheless, I, I don't want to say it's, it's kind of an approach I'll be talking about in this class versus object-oriented programming. I think these concepts are absolutely things that we want to build on because these are essential for design, implementation, verification, test. In another lecture, I'd spend a fair amount of time talking up how important these, these concepts are. Okay. But basically, what I think particularly those in this class probably believe is that what computations we do is as important as, as how we do them. In other words, object-oriented programming had this kind of, I think, imbalanced view that if you just structure your code right and you have a copy of Corman Lyserson's book on algorithms on your desk, you're probably, probably pretty well home to a good implementation. But you know from this class, I think the rest of this class, is that as you go through this, these class of computations, these are what we variously call the dwarfs, the motifs, or I'll call them the computational patterns, that there's a lot to know about how to do each, each one of these computations. And so have you seen this chart before? Yeah, okay, many times, all right. So I don't need to explain, perhaps for whoever may be seeing this later, uh, red here means that there's high intensity of that computation, orange or looks yellow here, uh, somewhat less. Uh, the yellow versus green, it's really hard to see in the screen, but these are, these are green, showing even less, and then blue or, or white, depending on just how you're, how you're viewing it, shows that that computation hardly shows up at all. These are six or seven areas where we went in depth and surveyed the broad fields, like computer design of integrated circuits, and these are five particular applications which we're doing in the PAR lab, okay? So some of you already knew that. As a matter of fact, some of you were probably coming much more from the orientation, and I see Brian back there, certainly Jim's career and so forth, very computation-centric, maybe not so object-oriented programming-centric, right? So um, in general, high-performance computing clearly knows a lot about application concurrency, efficient programming, parallel implementation, a lot of things that the object-oriented community does not. But uh, my impression uh, of the high performance community's view of how to do Perl uh, or how to do software architecture is, you know, you kind of spend a lot of time on, on the computation. And then if we were to use the building analogy on top of that, literally you just kind of put a Quonset hut on top of that and say, there's our architecture. And, you know, you even, you know, bless your hearts, the high performance community has even given this structure a name, it's called a monolithic architecture. That is to say, basically, it, it's just a big single computation, right? So what is the right metaphor for software development? So here's a hint. Is software more like A, a building, or B, a factory? What do you think? Okay, this is not, this is not high school. 
I'd like to see raised hands real take a position on this question, A or B. How many think A? How many think B? Oh, come on. This is really feeling like, I feel like I'm filming the Blackboard Jungle here or something like with the people. Why do I have to raise my hand? It's so. Come on, one more time. How many think A? Well, everybody's got to take a vote. Put your money on a number. Okay, I've got about seven, eight of you, nine. How many of you think it's more like a factory? Okay, about, we're split about 50-50. Patrick, why do you think it's more like a building? Well, so we're, we're talking about, I, I see what you're saying. Build, build the same thing. So just to want to make sure, I think you got it, but it occurs to me in case other people are confused. So we're talking about the software, you know, the software is the building or the software is the factory, not how do we, what is the process of, of making the software, right? So, okay, that's, that's clear. Okay, so who else wants to advocate how software is like a building? I saw a lot of raised hands. Yes, sir. So building a building, um, like you said, you, you build it once. There are certain you know, patterns and techniques that you can use to build all buildings, but except in the you know, construction development side, it's not, you know, take the same pattern and just stamp, stamp, stamp. There's always you know, customization and combination. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. I wonder if we should be grabbing these with the, you have all this high-priced yeah. help, right? You know, so here's the, yeah. okay. Who would like to advocate that software is like a factory? Give me so half the class. Okay, maybe I'll try and bolster. Here we go. Brave gentleman in front here. Hold, hold on just a second. Here's a mic. We don't want to mess this in posterity. Um, software moves uh, like along a pipeline, like from concept to design to development to quality assurance testing, kind of like. Yeah. Like so that's the that's the that's the the interpretation that I'm trying to avoid, which is. We're not. We're talking about a program once it's once it's been developed. So we're not talking about the process of creating a program. We're talking about once a program exists, is it more like a factory or more like a building? Someone else. Over here. All right. Some brave souls. Over here. Oh, you, you're welcome to. Yeah. That's right. You got the microphone. You can. No, there are two two people. <laughs> Okay, so once the software is built, I feel it's more like a factory because if you have issues with the production line, you keep iterating, you keep you know, rebuilding or improving upon it. Okay, that's that sounds good. Yeah, please. Um, I think it's more like a factory because when you create a program, you give it some inputs, you expect some outputs, and that sense, it's kind of like a factory. Give that woman a cigar. <laughs> that's a, or if you don't smoke cigars, you're yogurt or whatever you want. <laughs> Okay, absolutely, that's what I think. That's what suddenly, 10 years after standing up, made, making eye contact, being evangelical about software as a building, I woke up, wait a minute. Buildings sit there like a brick, right? They don't do anything. They provide shelter, they, they have little rooms and so forth. They don't do a lot. Factories do a lot. Most importantly, just as you said, they take input, they warehouse intermediate results, they produce output. That's a big difference, but somehow, to this day, at campuses all around the country, we're still, 90.9% .9 of them are talking about software as a building, right? Today, we're going to think about an, another metaphor. Okay, so um, what we wanna do here in this very lecture is integrate what we learned from object-oriented programming and what we learned from high-performance computing here. And so we wanna integrate the insights into computation, and together with insights of program structure. So this person that we're trying to create, creating a software architecture, what are they thinking about? Today we'll be talking about the computational patterns as well as what will be principally the focus of, of today's lecture since you're spending a lot of the course on these computations on the structural patterns to kind of complement that. Okay, and we'll be talking about them as patterns. So one of our challenges was you know, we had these uh, kind of growing up from the high-performance community, these seven dwarfs that became the 13 motifs and so forth. And, and then we, we, I, I felt that these coming up out of the object-oriented programming community, that these um, object-oriented architectural styles 
were also very important. And the question is, if we were to look at them in some common language, what are they? And so what seemed to be kind of the right uh, common type, if we think of this as a type, type coercion problem, is, is pattern. So there's a gentleman here who taught in our architecture school for many years named Christopher Alexander. And what he developed was the notion of a pattern in trying to solve architectural problems as well as a pattern language. So pattern just describes a problem which occurs over and over in our environment and then describes the core of the solution of the problem in such a way that you can use the solution a million times over with, without ever doing, the same, doing it the same way twice. Or So my terse definition is it's a generalizable solution to a recurring problem. Okay? So this is, this is from his book. And what's amazing about this book is in a, in a kind of, you know, it's probably about, I think about my age when, when he wrote it, a kind of somewhat mature, mature point of his career, where he took a step back and he looked at not just, gosh, how do you knock out a building, but he looked at if we were to, to suddenly find the earth for the fir first time and repopulate it, how would we distribute towns across the earth? How would we put roads in? Then how would we get to buildings and then individual units and so forth? And so he starts out, you know, pattern number two is how do you distribute towns over the planet? And by the time you get down to pattern 232, it's a very small scale architectural element known as a roof cap, right? Very, very incredible vision. Okay, then his pattern language. So this is, the, the, the book is not just a collection of one pattern, this problem solution pair after another, but it's a, it's a, it's a notion of pattern language. How do you kind of navigate through this big, big set of patterns to produce a, a um, whatever you're trying to do, a building, a shopping center, and so forth, right? And so maybe as computer scientists, the way we think of it is the patterns are vertices, and then the pattern language includes the, all the edges of how you, how you traverse them, okay? Now, of course, this is about civil, not software architecture. So what I'll be talking about today is how we use these notion of patterns to uh, create an architecture of, of a program or software. And so um, broadly, there's what I'll be talking about today, which is a set of structural patterns which describe the structure, and a set of computational patterns which describe what you actually do with the, the structure, these two. OK, so how do we use these ideas to actually architect software? So broadly, of, oftentimes, I would say most times, when we're, when we're given a particular application to do, we have a particular angle. Maybe we're thinking more like high-performance computing, or maybe it's just, in, in since we're focused on the computation, or maybe it's just the computation is more important. Or other times, you know, uh, particularly if you come more from the object oriented style, you'll be thinking much more of the structure, and then you'll be looking at the computations. But in any case, one way or the other, you're going to find yourself iterating through what are the key computations, and what's the structure to support them. And within that structure, what are the computations? And then what's the structure to implement them? And if you're really stuck there, even if, even if that, like, I'm still stuck. I, I, I don't know. I just don't have a grip on this problem. Then you can just say, OK, what are the tasks? Just brainstorm tasks. Just go with the whiteboard. Just name the tasks to be formed. And is there any particular order between them? Is, is there, is there, are there dependencies? And then you look at data, you know, draw boxes. What's the data in there? And then you go, well, where do we have data sharing, and how do we how do we uh, have to kind of traffic cop the data access? Okay, so if you're, you know, I think, however, most times I think you'll you'll immediately jump into here. But if you find a problem where you're completely stuck, and I, you know, I mean, when I go up to Microsoft and they start talking about their printer spoolers and their operating systems, I have to say I go I find myself going all the way back to here because I'm just not familiar enough with those applications to jump in and see what's going on. But most of the time, back home here in Berkeley, looking at what my students are doing, then, then we can focus here. So identify the software structure. Okay, so um, the, uh, what we have here are a set of structural patterns. Um, you'll, you'll see a broader set on, on some of the other slides. And these are basically how we, how we create the modularity. These are, these are what grew out of the object-oriented uh, programming paradigm. Okay, they describe the structure of our software, 
but they don't describe what is computed. And so my analogy here is that this is like the layout of a factory plant. So we're running with this, this analogy that software is like a factory, which this young lady articulated so clearly. And these structural patterns say, OK, if this is the plant we want to build, how should we lay it out? You know, what, what needs to kind of be, you know, allow for a lot of access? What can really be spread out? When do things have to come to, back together? How do they need to be synchronized, right? Then we identify the key computations. You're all familiar with this, I understand. And to me, this is, this is analogous to the machinery of the factory. Now, again, if, if we, so excuse me for, for beating on it, but I'm, I'm beating on myself because I taught it for 10 years, and I'm beating on half the class that that's, that was their spontaneous uh, notion of, of how, what, what, soft, what a software program is. So if you think of software as a building, and only as a building, then you're, you're not really, you know, it's like building a factory without really thinking about the machinery that you're putting in there. And I think from the moment I had that observation, I could never quite, I, I just kept going, how did I ever think it was that way? Who would ever build a building or, or a factory without thinking about the machinery that was going to inhabit the factory, right? So this is, this is analogous to the machinery of the factory, and then we, we put these together to have an architect factory. So this was our overall factory layout, and this is a little mock-up of particular machinery we might put in there. Now, the day that I had the big aha, oh, programs are, are like machinery, I literally walked over to Bechtel Library, or Bechtel Building went to the library, and go, oh, civil engineers must know a lot about this, right? I mean, factories are, are, are quite, quite, you know, mature concept. And sure enough, I pop open the book, and they're talking about things we talk about. Scheduling. You know, how do you schedule all this machinery? Or how do you schedule materials going through the factory? Latency. How long does it take to go from end to end? How much throughput can you get in an hour? Uh, what's the workflow? Workflow is not a term that I think, uh, do you guys, you hyper for now? <laughs> but, but basically it just says, okay, how does a particular set of data flow through this? How do we do resource management? We talk a lot about that. And what's the total capacity of this? Yeah, Jim. Do you want to use your microphone? Do they, do they use the lo word locality? Um, they certainly are aware of the word locality because, you know, it's interesting. I mean, you know, we do all this computational optimization, but at the end of the day, it's kind of no skin off our back. In the sense, we, 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 we don't feel tired at the end of the day because we did a computation poorly. But I'll tell you, when you actually have people carrying things from one thing to another, you start to think a lot about locality. How do, how do we not have to take that back and forth from workstation to workstation? One of my favorite things in, in here is uh, um, how, how, how large should a workstation be, which is analogous to, so that's the actual, what's the physical, you're, you're going to put some machinery together, what's a good physical size for that? So that's analogous to what, what programming concept? Is it like granularity, uh, how much work you give each thread? Yeah, that's, ex that's exactly like granularity. Or, um, and from a visual standpoint, it's, you know, even in sequential programming, it's you know, like how, how big should a function be, right? And, and we, all, we all know that question. There are pluses to making it big. There are pluses to making it small. There's a general programming sense of I know about the right size. Right. OK, so then with that concept, uh, with that concept, then going back to this, this iterative process of building, building our factory here, identifying the structure, identifying the computations, back and forth to build the whole factory. So um, again, I describe these as patterns. So I've taken, essentially, I've, I've taken a bunch of architectural styles from the object-oriented programming community and Garland and Shaw in particular, and I've called those structural patterns. And I've taken a, our are 13 dwarfs, I've called those computational patterns. Why patterns? Patterns give names and definitions to key elements of design. When we first started working on this, I was over at the, the opening of the National Instruments Lab. Someone was, was asking me um, you know, some question about we have this you know, particular problem. Uh, this was you know, just a grand opening, but somebody, somebody tackled me for 
a little free consulting. You know? <laughs> and this is this program. I had a few of my students around me and a bunch of National Instruments employees, and I said, well, I don't know, that just looks like you know, process control with a little element being agent and repository. Okay? That may not mean a lot at this moment. Hopefully it'll mean more at the end of the lecture. But the relevant thing is that you know, four of my students nodded their hair head and you know, like, yeah, we know exactly what you mean. That's a very terse sentence without any drawing at the whiteboard to convey the whole architecture of a piece of software. And I think that was probably the, the appropriate piece of architecture. So because I gave them names and definitions, I could convey a lot of information. So this, um, this gives us, this helps us a lot in teaching. So, and there's two ways. Number one, um, I would guess, if you're like me, you got all the way to grad school with a relatively modest palette of modular design principles and probably a modest palette of computations with which you're familiar. But we, in both the area of structure and computation, Hopefully, I'm almost certain we're going to give you some new ideas. I'm sure Jim in this course has given you some new computational ideas. Today, I'll give you some new modular structure ideas, right? But equally, so that'll jog your thinking. Well, I'm tempted to apply these three structures that I know, but gosh, oh, I guess, I guess, you know, I never really thought about puppeteer before. Maybe that's just the, maybe that's just the right structure for this problem. The flip side of that is it gives you a sense of finiteness, which you know maybe uh, you know this will save you ten years of your career. I spent a lot of my career going, staring at whiteboards and saying, "There's got to be a better way to do this." I just feel like you know this is an okay structure for this software, but this is not quite the right one. Or you know there's got to be some books on computation I haven't read, which would give me a better idea of how to do this. But this the fact that you have this finite set of computational patterns. If you find, well, yeah, I mean, it, I guess it really is just a sparse matrix, and it's not a graph, I think you can kind of drive home or walk home you know, confidently like, well, that's, that's just about it. So it gives a sense of finitude. You don't need to be thinking, maybe there's one more book I should be reading, or maybe we should bring in a consultant. OK, um, you can articulate design decisions succinctly, as I did in that little uh, you know, uh, opening party. And um, this certainly improves documentation and design through communication of, of the concepts facilitating the maintenance. And then, so this is kind of in, in teaching design. Um, once you suppose, um, you all know the puppeteer pattern, but you don't know it yet. Um, but this, let me jump ahead a little bit and say, suppose I know that something is, is the puppeteer pattern. I know sooner or later the puppeteer will be the bottleneck in that system. I know right off. Maybe it'll take three years. Maybe it'll take seven years. If I, I, I know if it's agent and repository. I know sooner or later the repository manager will be the bottleneck in that. You know, make, you know makes it sound like you, <laughs> you, know, you have some secret knowledge. But the perspective of, of the patterns tell you a lot about the likely challenges and bottlenecks that will come. It also tell you a lot about, you know, uh, Damon Rousen at Sundia Labs has written a whole significant paper on merging towards a book on just how to use the puppeteer pattern. If you find that your puppeteer pattern is what you want to use, then there's a lot of body of knowledge that you can immediately roll in. Okay, so now, uh, do you take breaks? Stretch breaks, anything? Well, why don't we just stretch for, for a couple of minutes? <coughs> You can also, uh, you know, check your email or whatever. So grad class is actually, the students are actually taking a break. In my undergraduate class, when we, when we take a break, the students are still like, <laughs> I'm afraid they're going to miss something. <laughs> as long as not everybody goes and stands in line. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, the, the, so this is this is something that uh, the National Instrument guys were looking at because you know they do they do a lot of of uh, real time design, and so yeah, I mean, um, there's a whole bunch of things. Invariance. Uh, every structural pattern has a particular kind of verification style and some invariance associated with it. Uh, particular places, natural places to put performance monitors. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, it's a. Uh, I kind of feel like, you know, either this will you know, fizzle out or it'll become like a whole field because you know, there's, it, 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 it touches every, every aspect of, of design. So, yeah. Okay, dokey. So let me now go into depth on some structural patterns. So this is a, a full list. I, I, I saw in some of the slides, you know, uh, a little fewer than this, but the, these are kind of the nine Nine structural patterns that were our working list. You know, will it be someday be eleven? I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think it'll be eight. <laughs> I don't think it'll be thirty. Right? Okay. So just to work on our vocabulary a little bit. So in a in a structural pattern, and for those of you who are familiar with the literature, this is right out of architectural styles. Components are where the computation happens. Connectors are where the communication happens, and a configuration, if we think of these as, as vertices and edges, is just a particular graph, incarnational ga graph. And a structural pattern can be described as a family of graphs. So it's not a graph, but it's a whole kind of family with common characteristics. So here's everybody's most commonly used pattern, the pipe and filter. Um, you have these connectors, which is where the, the communication occurs. You have filters, which is where the computation occurs. You may have some feedback. You probably don't have a lot of feedback. Now, one thing that, that I've learned to pull all the way forward, because spoken or unspoken, I notice you look out on the class and a lot of things are going, well, why is this or that? You know, why, what's the difference between Puppeteer and, you know, or, or why isn't that a static task graph and so forth? Twelve years into this, I finally have my analogy. So. When I go to uh, clean the trap on my drain, I'm really happy I have a pipe wrench. Everybody know what a pipe wrench looks like? It's got grooves on it and all that stuff. I could use a crescent wrench. Crescent wrench will work. It tends to slip a little more. I can keep that pipe wrench exactly the right size for, for a common, you know, not on the pipe thread and so forth. So in a similar way, if you look at these as kind of some basis of some vector set of structures, no, that's, that's not what they are. They are not orthogonal, but they, are, they describe particular ways that humans like to solve problems. So there is some feedback here. If you said this is pipe and filter and 90% of your edges were going back, I'd say, it's not exactly what I think of pipe and filter. You have a few edges going back, you don't have, you don't have so many. Mainly it's feed forward, okay? And these filters are stateless, that is to say, uh, from a global perspective, there's no there's no shared state from these. Okay, so what's an example from your software experience of pipe and filter? Looks like we want to have that microphone just. Where are you? Don't you have TAs that can run around with this? Where? Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> 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 Okay. So I have to have a hand up. Yeah. Hand just, yeah. Pipe and filter. Uh, compiler development? Compiler. Give that man a cigar. <laughs> What's another one? Every program you've probably ever written, right? So let's, let's look at So compiler. <laughs> You know, as soon as you see this, I mean, you know, you scan, you build an internal representation, you optimize the program, you generate code, object code, and so forth. You know, almost every software you've ever written has been complicated enough that you naturally broke it down into a series of uh, computations with data passing between them, right? So pipe and filter. This is logic optimization. This is an image retrieval system that we built in my group, right? At the highest level, almost all software looks like 
pipe and filter. But compiler, I think, is, is the poster child. And compiler is a, is a good example about what I keep meaning to, to, to modify in this, because in a compiler, when you build this internal representation, do you pass it like a, a you know, function parameter to, to the next stage or something? No, you, you build a persistent representation. And so I've always thought pipe and filter should really be called pipe, filter, and water tower, because almost always there's a hidden persistent data structure that's created through this that all the filters access. So it's like, like a water tower if we want to use pipe and filters. OK, we're on a roll. Iterator pattern. So here we have initialization condition. Then we have a variety of functions performed asynchronously. Then before we get through this iteration, we need to synchronize the results of the iteration. We have some exit condition met qu question. If so, then we're done. Otherwise, we iterate. Now, that exit condition can be as simple as a loop iteration variable, or it can be as complicated as some uh, complex mathematical expression. So one thing to accentuate on this, why is it important that these functions here are performed asynchronously? I mean, wh why is that something we really want to feature here to a class on parallel programming, for example? Oh, come on. Yes, this gentleman here. Because um, you want to do them all at the same I, time? I think, I think you want to talk this way into it. Till it for, for, there you go. Because you want to do them all at the same time? Uh, you want to get as many of, you know, as you want to saturate the amount of parallelism available to you. So in brief, yeah, you want to do as, as close as possible, you're going to do them all at the same time, right? In your exit condition. OK, what's an example of this one? Right behind. The iterative matrix solvers would be an example. Of matrix solvers, keep them coming. Come on. You're, you're not all here from social sciences or something, right? I mean, it's, it's a, you know. um, something like gradient descent. Sure. Yeah. Any any optimization, sorry, iterative oper optimization will basically look like this, and it's just a matter of how complex this exit condition is. Okay. So this is in support of vector machine training. When we're training a classifier, you know, we go through this iteration. We update the surface on some iteration. So we've got kind of like the the white hats and the black hats kind of separated. And then are there any outliers? Are there any black hats that are all mixed up very, very far into the white hats? If so, let's go ahead, plan to iterate and, and update the surface to, to kind of curve around them and get them back on the right side, right? OK. Iterator pattern. OK, MapReduce. So youngsters like you think that MapReduce began with Google. Uh, Old timers like Jim and I know that it was in Lisp. And we had a lecture on it last time. Okay, good, good. So, and I presume you use the same definition that basically it's as simple as you map a. Uh, actually, I've changed this on another slide. Sorry, this is one of those um, sticky bits. You map a function onto independent data, not. I think it's kind of backwards to think of data as mapped onto independent computations. You're mapping the same computation onto independent sets of, sets of data, OK? And then you reduce that. OK, examples of that. You can, you just had a lecture on it. <laughs> Jim says, Jim was here. <laughs> MapReduce, what's, what's a poster child of MapReduce? Aren't you, aren't you glad this isn't the final? It's a, it's a uh, answer? Do we have an answer? Yeah. I, I think that's a good thing. If you hold the microphone, you have to give an answer. So <laughs> take, take a shot. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Can you use it for molecular simulations? Can you like take a piece of data and from each simulation box? 
and map it into or reduce it? Um, if, the, if you have a number of independent um, simulations going simultaneously and you want to reduce down something, like, yeah, that's, that's kind of a high performance computing or kind, of, kind, of, kind of answer, which is more the kind we're looking at, right? I mean, usually I get, come on, what's, what's a Google answer? Page rank. Page rank would be a good example. Or just in you know, classic things like word count, word count across web pages or things like that, you know, or, or word instance count. Those are all kind of web oriented. But yeah, when we, when we do this um, outlier computation on, for training the support vector machine, we do that out, outlier computation as, as a MapReduce. There's a whole bunch of inner products, and then they're all reduced back to find the outlier, for example. OK, uh, agent and repository. Um, this is one, going back to Garland and Shaw. I haven't distinguished here between kind of the classic object-oriented patterns like this one and those like MapReduce, which we, we kind of um, brought in because they're motivated by parallel applications. Um, but in agent repository, also known as Blackboard, you have a, a database, or what's also, the Blackboard, or also known as the Blackboard. You have a set of agents which can read and write this. And then you have a manager which traffic cops, you know, kind of there's a lot of, typical lot of housekeeping to do with the database. It does all that. And it also traffic cops access to the database. So what's an example of this structural pattern? Facebook? Facebook, yeah. Yep, I mean, I actually don't know how Facebook is implemented, but I'll bet they have pretty much a, a monolithic uniform, even if it's, now this, the details, so this, this brings up a good point. There's the way we, the way the high level programmers and architects think about it, and the where there's the way that you implement this. There's nothing about the repository that says that it has to be actually physically implemented in one single server, one single machine, one single database. You can distribute it. But if conceptually to the programmers, to, a, to a, someone adding an app in Facebook, I've got a monolith of Facebook members, and I've got agents which can act on that monolithic database, then that's agent and repository. Yeah, Jim. Banks and ATMs. Banks and ATMs. You bet, right? OK, so for me, um, when I think of like, uh, for those, who know, those of you who know the Stanford SWEEF, parallelizing compiler, you know, it had this internal program representation, and then basically you could write a menu of uh, compiler optimizations. If you look at contemporary logic optimization, of, you know, industrial strings say it's an opsis, it's design compiler, it looks exactly the same, same architecture. So <clears throat> an agent may come in, do its optimization, back, back out, and the resulting program is just left in the, or the resulting intermediate representation program is left in the repository. Okay, yeah, logic optimization also. Okay, another one of my favorites, process control. So here you have a process, which is some phenomena that's being controlled and computed. You have actuators, which actually act on this process. You have a sensor, which is sitting here um, sensing the status of the process at all times, and then you have uh, some control parameters which are input, say from a user, and a controller which tells the actuator what to do. Okay? And because it's a cycle, um, you can come at this different ways. Now, first of all, this is, I preempted the question, but this is, if I haven't heard it so far, usually about this point in the lecture is when I hear, why isn't this pattern a, What pattern does this look a lot like? Pipe and filter, right? I mean, it, it, it's visually, you know, if that was just rectangular, that was just rectangular. This would look visually exactly like a pipe and filter. Why don't we just want to use pipe and filter? Well, again, this, this, is, this is my pipe bridge. So, oh, we have an answer. So this is more specialized. There's a lot of specific theory that applies specifically to this pattern. Right. So to go a little deeper on that, um, let's, what are some examples of this? <laughs> He's passed this course already. 
Examples. Yeah. Um, like the C CPU speed modulator for your laptop? Uh, well, I mean, s certainly if you, yeah, oh, like turbocharging and all that, or even thermal regulation, that's, that's a, that's a you know, ti timely example. What's, what's the poster child example? Now, I, I, I can tell we don't have any poker players in this audience because I, I did what's known as a poker tell when I looked over there. Yeah. The thermostat. The thermostat. That's, that's the classic example. Right. Oops. Carried away. So this is the typical, you know, this is the process to be controlled. Here's the controller, actuator. This is a sensor. This is, this is how I always thought about logic optimization for circuits. You have a circuit that you're working on. You have some timing constraints. Um, you're, you have the controller, which is... Sorry, using user timing constraints go in here to the controller as well. That causes you've got some smarts to figure out what what um, actuations or transformations will I launch now, and then you have a sensor here which says how we how we met our speed goal, how we met our power goal. You can do a compiler optimization just like this. So this example, uh, you know, kind of fleshes out exactly why I want to call this process control and not just pipe and filter, because. This, this is running all the time, and, and it also, I think, illustrates the, the, the power of these structural patterns in, in organizing your work. So I can uh, delegate probably one person per, these are pretty complicated sensors to, to, um, to build, to do nothing other than given a circuit, what's its speed, or given a circuit, what's its power, right? All they need to know is the representation of the circuit, and they need to do something that's lightweight enough that it's kind of running all the time, right? But they don't need to worry about the rest of this. Similarly, I can get logic optimization experts who know all about the complex battery of, of logic optimizations to, to perform for timing or, or for area or for power and so forth. And they, all they know is they just need to know, given the state of the circuit and the particular um, you know, current performance or current power, which one of those to apply. Now, if they're way off the, the, time, the, the, the timing constraint, they know they've got to apply some pretty heavy-duty transformations. If they're very close, then they have a bunch of fine-tuning, right? But they don't need to know, how did you figure out how close you were? That's, that's a whole other kind of problem. So I can basically take my, say, six or seven-person group and chop them up into working on separate tasks with very, very thin specifications between them, right? So that's, that's an example of the power of, of this structural pattern. Qu question? Yeah. Yes, sir. Would real-time financial trading be an example? You bet. You bet. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a real high-frequency trading would would look a, exactly like this. Yeah. Yeah. Way to go, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Not my business. <laughs> okay, puppeteer. All right. So you have puppets here, which are doing particular computations, and you need to manage control of the interactions of these multiple computational or simulation agents, okay? And the puppeteer pattern guides this interaction to guarantee the correctness of the overall result. So the agents do whatever the agents do, and then the puppeteer basically has two responsibilities. One is to schedule them, what puppets go at what time, and the other is to transfer data back and forth between them. Now, the puppeteer, the advantage of the structural pattern, and we'll get a little more in detail when we look at some real examples, is if I'm a puppet and, I'm, and I know down the road, okay, today I have two other agents or puppets that I'm working with, I need to interface with them. I don't need to write a, puppet one doesn't need to, have, to write an interface to puppet two, puppet three, puppet n, and so forth. It just writes an interface to the puppeteer, right? That's ditto for all of them. That means I can add more later, I can take some out, I don't have all these dependencies. Um, so difference between agent and repository, so there's no single central repository here. So oftentimes you're, you're in a toss up, let's see, do I use agent repository, or do I use puppeteer? The question is, are they all the agents acting on a, on a, on a single central repository, or at least a logically central repository, or do they have their own data? 
probably Puppet 1 has the way that Puppet 1 likes to do things, and the data representation Puppet 2 has a different one. Okay, so we'll go in a little more detail when we get some real examples. What are some examples of the puppeteer pattern? Video games. Video games. What else? Now I know population of this group, yes. <laughs> Operating systems. Operating systems would require a little more, I'm, well, actually, that's a, that's a, I'm, we'll get to that in a moment. We'll, that's, that's an interesting, interesting way of looking at things. Others? Uh, yeah. Uh, like combinatorial algorithms, branch and bound? Could be. Um, well, that, that, but computational patterns are implemented in structural patterns, but uh, well, let's not, um, well, briefly, if, if the computations, if, if you're like exploring different subspaces and you want to bring the result back, you can imagine doing it that way. The problem is most often what this doesn't allow for, this is what you can add puppets at compile time or, or you know, load time, but you cannot add puppets dynamically in this. So typically in a branch and bound type computation, okay, you take this quadrant, you take this quadrant, but then you're going to recursively break that quadrant more and more. Puppeteer pattern is not flexible enough to do that. In the back. Any sort of uh, multi-physics simulation or multi-whatever fill in the That's blank. what I was waiting for, yeah. Mm -hmm. It'd be an odd year in this class if somebody doesn't, doesn't have that answer. Yeah, those are all good examples. Okay, so, so here's a video game um, where the physics subsystem, the graphics, and the, and the AI portion, they all have very different ways of looking at the world. They do not want to share a single 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 representation. Even among, say, the physics, there's oftentimes kind of physics often has a hierarchical puppeteer where under physics you have a puppeteer and then the little different pieces of physics have different ways that they want to render things, right, before they, they update the game state and so forth. So video games, um, here is from the Par Lab, and I think a really great example where, uh, which gets to the scheduling issues, which is, um, you know, and, and this is often kind of when you're using legacy code, how these problems, uh, you know, come forward is you've got a large body of code doing blood vessel simulation. You know, a few doctoral dissertations worth there, and you have a large body of code doing uh, blood simulation, blood flow, fluid dynamic, excuse me, style. Okay, now uh, there, these two types of simulations are very different. So they have two very different underlying representations. It would be a nightmare to try to figure out how to do a single representation agent and repository style that was common to both of those. Moreover, what else is different about these two? Think scheduling. Is there any different way you would schedule these two differently? Yeah. <laughs> well, or more generally, the person with the, who's holding the microphone has to answer. <laughs> um, so you need them to communicate with each other because they determine the boundary conditions, but right. ideally they might have different sort of time steps. Okay, so let's, that's exactly right, but we have a particular example here. How often do you think the blood vessel needs to be updated relative to the blood flow? I honestly have no idea. Well, I would say much. Much, much less, right? I mean, the vessel slowly changes as a function of blood flow, but there's a whole lot of stuff going on in blood flow before you need to make any change. So you have, you have the, the puppeteer is kind of in charge of determining, okay, we're, we're going to run you for this many, maybe a thousand iterations. Okay, now let's update the blood vessel. That'll set different boundary conditions for the blood flow, back and forth like that, okay? And then maybe you find, well, you know, we're just, we're not seeing enough um, you know, of, of the details that we, we need to get out of the simulation with that. Now, this is just two simulations, but probably I think the people in this room have enough experience. If you'd kind of handcrafted the usual late afternoon hacky tacky interface between these two, and then you know, the, the end domain expert comes in and says, we're, we're not getting the information we need out of this, the thought of exactly you know, going in, recoding the rates and so forth, maybe you had a really good afternoon, you, you 
passed it as a parameter or something, it's not a pretty picture. On the other hand, if you know you can just go to the puppeteer kind of control panel, you know, kind of logically a throttle dial up and, up and down, so forth like this, change in time sets, maybe experiment, maybe, maybe vary it over, over just to see, right? You know, that would, be, that would be a much, much better structure for doing those experiments. Okay, so that, that didn't cover every single uh, structural pattern, and uh, let me get back to, I, I had forgotten whether I had the layered computational pattern in there, so, I mean, structural patterns, so let me. Okay, for those of you who are watching the video, I'm doing a series of rectangles on top of each other. This is what's called a layered computational pattern. Okay, these are where the computations are. And these are where the communications are, just edges between them, okay? What are some examples of this? The computations which use this structure, or name brand applications. Go ahead. Right here? Anyway? Well, hint. This is a stack. What kind of things are, are in stacks? Like, I'll give another hint. So you already mentioned, I believe that, operating systems, right? So this looks like what other pattern? We could, we could call this a Oh, come on. We could also call this just cosmetically. You know, what does this, this looks like? Filter? Yeah. These look like pipes, right? These go both directions. That's a little unusual. But otherwise, this is a pipe and filter. However, back to the pipe wrench versus crescent wrench, this is a very particular structure. Okay, so operating systems are layered in a particular way. What's, an, what's another ISO protocol stack? Layered in a particular way. These, these relationships between layers have a whole bunch of protocol associated with them, right? Typically our pipe and filter doesn't have a bunch of protocol. Okay, so this is a very special layer structure. So one alternative is to look at, is this kind of pipe and filter laid on its side? Not exactly, because the contract in an operating system or the contract in, in, in a protocol stack is between layer and layer, and there's not some central over, over agent like the puppeteer looking down at those layers. So the, the layers make contracts among each other. Okay? So, so to be concrete, the internet yeah. and how messages are sent across the internet? Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, the, yeah. so TCP IP as a protocol will have many layers, starting you know physical layer, all the way up to application layer, seven, seven layers or whatever, with different protocols between each two layers, right? But the communication, the key thing you see from visually this is layers only communicate with each other. You know, you don't kind of end around and suddenly go from here to there, okay? Yeah, so I just wanna, I mentioned that structural pattern since the operating system example had come up also. Okay, as for detail and computational patterns, well, you're, you're spending the whole course on this. So this is, this is the, maybe in the future we'll call this the course on computational, <laughs> right? And, and we only do a subset of them. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, and, and it's not surprising, right? I mean, a lot of Jim's career has been focused around just these two computational patterns. And there are, there's no pattern here so unimportant that it doesn't have multiple books written about it, right? So. Okay, so what I'd like to do is put these concepts together a little bit, and so I'm going to go through one example. So this is an example we've been working on in my group for years, which is called speech recognition. Uh, this, is, this is not a architecture of speech recognition in our terms. This is just a high-level system model. You have voices input. You do some signal processing to break these down into speech features, which are known as phones. And after some years, I know, now know, I think, the difference between a phone and a phoneme. Phonemes are in a language. Phones are language independent. 
Okay, does that make sense? So German and English can share phones. You know, I guess German and English can also share phonemes, but there are phonemes in say um, Hindi, which are which are not in English, right? But there are phones. The phones are, are common across all languages. Okay, so these are speech features. This is what actually does the recognition, the recognition network and the inference engine, and then given voices input, you get words as, as output. So uh, I've had uh, two or three generations of students work on this, and the first student came up with this high-level architecture. And so at the highest level, as we look at the voice input through the speech extractor, into this, think of this as one big box, and this out. What, what architectural pattern is, is the highest level architecture of this? Pipe and filter, Pipe and filter. Yeah, exactly. OK, so going a little more deeply, if we look in here, um, how many of you are familiar with speech recognition? Uh, okay, <laughs> all right, then, then I'll just tell you. Basically, the computational patterns which you use here are graphical models and dynamic programming. You'll, you'll understand a little bit of why that is the case, uh, I think, um, after I explain it to you. Um, then, okay, so if we look then inside this box now, so think of this as pipe and filter. This is one big filter. Inside this filter, what's this computational pattern on the outside? I'm sorry? I heard it. I know I heard it. Iterator, yeah. Iterations is kind of a tip off that this is an iterator pattern. And then inside this iterator pattern, this is the block, or the body of the iterator pattern. And inside of this, we have this three phase thing, which looks like. Uh, well, we have three boxes here with arrows between them. That, that level is. Pipe and filter, right? This is just a three filters with pipes between them. And then if we look inside, what pattern is that? MapReduce, right? Yeah, okay, so there we go. Now, one nice thing about this is um, this is a, a name brand application. It's an important application. How many of you have an iPhone 4S? Nobody? Still, still grad students, yeah, it's tough. You know. <laughs> well, I, uh, anyway, so uh, the iPhone 4S, if, if not a, a lot of other applications, are really bringing speech recognition back, back into the, into the uh, Vogue. I mean, it's, it's an important application, but like any application, its stock rises and falls. And uh, this really is, you know, this is not some trimmed down, you know, kind of cartoon, grad school class version of speech recognition architecture. This, this is the architecture that we use, and I can even e explain it in more detail in, this, in these next three slides. So basically, the workhorse of, of uh, speech recognition um, going back to, I think, the 70s, starting, I believe, with Rabiner's work at Bell Laboratories, is what's known as the Viterbi algorithm, or what kind of algorithm is Viterbi in terms of our computational patterns? Have you covered this one yet? OK. Does anybody know? Dynamic programming. Viterbi's algorithm is a particular kind of variant of dynamic programming. And this is the key computation. So think of it this way. We're, we're kind of marching through a frontier of these phones. We observe phones, these little sound fragments, like reco, ni, you know, little fragments of speech. And as we see them, we build up a frontier of hypotheses about what word are we hearing. And then when we get to a particular point of, of confidence, then we un unravel that and say, this is what I think we, we heard. Right? And often that's either sentential periods or, or long pauses in speech or so forth. We know, OK, now's the time to stop and unravel this and decide what we actually heard. And at any step of that, basically, we have a computation here, which is we're trying to figure out the maximally likely next state. And that consists of a number of pieces. First is, what are the chances that we're in this state? That has a certain probability. What are the chances that when we're in this state, we go to this state? And we know we, we have training on lots and lots of, of, um, of tape recordings of speech. So we know how often this phone is next to that phone. So that's a 
that, that's known. And then we have given this new phone, so we went record nigh, so we heard nigh. What are the chances that observing a nigh and we're in this state, we go to this state? Right? And so then we look among the maximum likely of all the different ways to get to that state, and we choose that, and that labels the new state. And so we keep a frontier of these. Really. OK. So now back to the structural patterns. So this is the inner loop. We gather the operands. So all you high-performance computing types, why do we have to devote a whole big piece of this computation to just pulling the operands together? Performance programmers. And we want to feed this to a GPU with all that SIMD power. So we want to coalesce all of our operands together. We've got this. This is a graph algorithm. This is, these are among the toughest types of computations to parallelize. We've got pointers heading everywhere, pointing to next states. We don't want to be traversing all those arcs. We want to be coalescing all that together to do these computations. Then we do this probability computation around this observation. And then we choose the maximally likely one. Okay, So we have this iterator. The iteration is, is doing what in the frontier of our states? It's taking us from the current frontier, next phone, next state. Okay, It's just marching through this frontier. OK, let's pop one of these filters open. And how did we, how did, what was the high level architecture for that? MapReduce, thank you. OK, let's, let's pop open and take a look at that MapReduce. So this is that little computation. This is the total computation that we're doing. And so we're doing these inner product computations uh, piece at a time, spread out over a space. They're independent data sets. And then we're taking the max of those to determine the, the best way to, to get to that next state, or the maximum likelihood of getting to that next state. OK. So that's, let's take a step back again. So you've really seen all the pieces here. Right? This really is the architecture. These really are the computations we do. This really works. We can recognize speech with this. The student who, who, who first did this went out and, and did a commercial implementation of this at a data analytics company. Um, somebody wanted to do sentiment analysis for hotline support, and he went off and implemented that for them. Okay? And this is some, just to give you a sense of how does that last step. So we're kind of exploring through the frontier. These are maximally likely states. We get to the end. I guess we're done. And so we had a wreck a nice beach as a candidate potential interpretation. But the maximally likely was recognize speech. Okay. Usually I get a chuckle or two after that one, but it's, you know, I know it's early. Okay. Okay. So. Taking a step back, this approach that I presented in this class and, and kind of shown tersely in that, that last example, can, can it I really works. You? Yeah, Jim. So, so sometimes when you get one of those uh, uh, computations to decompose into patterns, there isn't a unique way to do it. Is there any, I mean, you could imagine doing things and nesting yeah. differently? Great, G great question. So how do, how Thank do you, you. Why was this a good one, or was it, is this the unique way? So. Um, this, this shows, so Jim's question, you know, why this one? I can, you know, Jim's computational is sitting up. There's a lot of different ways I could have done that. You know, we could have pushed the coalescing the operands into the individual computations. Um, we could have speculated on a, on a number and then fallen back. A lot, a lot of different things we could do. Programming is still an art, right? And so, you know, I talk about these design patterns as your, as your palette. I don't talk about them as, as your theory or something. It's your artistic palette. You know, you learn these. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that one good architecture ever precludes other good architectures. But the thing I notice about one good architecture versus another good architecture is the architect can explain them really well, why they made their architectural decisions, trade-offs. And when someone says, well, why not this architecture? That individual may have other really good reasons. And oftentimes, your doing the architecture based on the application and the probable use that you have. And then three years later, it's actually used in a very different way. 
right? Sentiment analysis for hotline analytics is very different from fast real-time speech, speech on a cell phone, right? Um, so, you know, this architecture may evolve. So, you know, I, I, I encourage students not to spend a lot of time asking questions like, is this the right one? And more thinking about what are the pluses and minuses of this one? So, thanks for that question. So, this is just kind of a, we've got our street cred um, uh, slide. So, you know, honestly, when, when we started doing this, when I began to collaborate with Tim Matson, and when we came up, even when we came up with the computational patterns, um, you know, I mean, who, who knows really, right? I mean, is this approach really going to work? Is this kind of not focusing on the right parts of the problem? But um, we've, we've done a lot of very wide range of applications. Certainly, I don't think anybody would say that speech recognition is a kind of slam dunk application. As a matter of fact, at the time, when these, you know, our results on these various problems were coming in, 11x, I mean, you know, the speech recognition people used to get kind of a, yeah, a tough day, huh? <laughs> of course, if I did it, probably I would do a lot better, but, you know, I'm so busy on my puzzle calculation or object recognition, so forth. As time went on, actually, the speech recognition result, I think, has, has really stood out because it's been so hard, hard to replicate or to achieve. That's a really good, for a graph algorith algorithmic computation like that with dynamic programming, that's actually a very good number speed up to get. These are the, all those impressive conferences, and these are um, downloads. We've got this software out there, and uh, looks. The, although this was released about a year later, it's actually coming up very very quickly. This is in machine learning. This is for object recognition. Um, I'm not an Intel, but I'll, I'll excuse me. I'm not an Intel, but I'll, I'll, I'll preempt a comment. Whenever I speak at Intel, which I did just a couple weeks ago, um, I get the question, "What do those speed ups mean?" Okay. The what all, what people often hear is when they see the architecture in which we say did optical flow, you're saying that. The architecture on which you started and the architecture that you ended on, often a GPU architecture, that GPU architecture is 32 times better than the initial architecture? No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying um, you, there's a tool called Live SVM. Tens of thousands of people use it. You pull that out of the box. You run it on, a, say, a Nehalem processor. You get one result. You take, it, you take our code. You run it on, on a, you know, a, a CPU multi-core GPU combination, you get these kind of speed ups. That's what we've observed. That's what we mean. To an application developer, that's pretty clear. This is faster than that. To a, that's not the same as to a computer architect. You know, could I have gotten that, that original CPU to go faster without a GPU and, and so forth? Is the distinction I'm making clear? You know, it's, we're, we're, not, we're not talking about architecture here. We're talking about application speed ups. And then we've, we've kind of felt obligated to defend ourselves. And so we, we put this this paper out there to kind of answer answer those those concerns. You, you had a question? Could we get the microphone to this gentleman? What is the speed? Like, what are you speeding up on the MRI? So um, the I think I have time for a true story here. So um, Mickey Lustig, who's now one of our E division professors here in Quarry Hall when he was interviewing here, finishing up his Stanford postdoc at Stanford. Um, he, he, uh, those of you who are, who are familiar with MRI, you go in, you take this huge number of samples, you throw most of them away, you produce an image. He and his advisor at Stanford had this bright idea, why take a bunch of samples, throw most of them away, produce an image, why not significantly undersample the samples and then produce the image, right? Makes a lot of sense. Has one big practical benefit, which is Fewer samples means fewer time sitting there, you know, all that. Which, for a kid, you know, I mean, it's annoying for an adult. It's practically impossible for a kid to sit still through a 40-minute, one-hour MRI. Often they have to be sedated, which is dangerous and so forth. So when Mickey was uh, interviewing here, I said, well, aren't you kind of building up kind of a computational IOU when you do that? And, you know, in a very jovial way, Mickey, I think, who must have felt he was, you know, pretty confident in his position here, says, Phew, I'm glad nobody asked me that before. <laughs> because, yeah, I mean, you get, you reduced your time in the MRI, say, from 40 minutes to 10 minutes, 
and then you had 24 hours to then you know, actually get the image back, or, or sometimes it could, it could be that bad. And the radiologists, they want to know right away, do we need to put the child through the MRI again? Do we need to take a different image? Do we need to, to look in a particular way? So uh, we were able to take that now, to be fair, that, that um, particular computation had some MATLAB and so forth in there, which is notoriously slow. So there were certainly some portions in there where there was you know, 10x off the top. On the other hand, a lot of it was MATLAB calling libraries, so those were faster. But it was a, a MATLAB kind of C, C++ type of implementation versus a G GPU, um, GeForce 8800 style you know, implementation. So yep. the MRI oversamples and it takes 40 minutes, but you undersample and it takes 10 minutes, but you don't build an image immediately. You have to wait. No, it takes, there's a lot of work to take that very undersampled data and turn that into an image which actually faithfully reproduces the, the you know, the, the, the patient being observed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, I said everything but the, yeah. yeah. The technique. So, so the name of the field is compressed sensing. Yes. Technique it, is compressed sensing. Yeah. And and this is now used at Stanford oh, Hospital. Oh yeah. Thank yes. you for throwing my bad <laughs> softball. So yeah, there. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a whole published study now about two. This has been in use for two years on real children at Lucille Packard Hospital. The doctor uh, Shreyas Vasanawala has now published mm -hmm. a result of his his uh, pediatric MRI work using this technique. So we are very satisfied to have this actually, you know, in in clinical use. Any questions about any other applications? It's a pretty diverse set of applications, and I'll come back to this. I mean, had you asked me and back in 2007, okay, Kurt, over the next four years, you're going to publish in transactions on medical imaging, conference on machine learning, conference on computer vision, uh, another computer vision conference, another one, inner speech, pre and speech recognition conference, and what the heck, maybe do an invited paper on uh, value risk assessment in a, in a financial uh, book. I go, yeah, right. But why, uh, how was I able to do that? I'll show you in just a moment, other, other than my great grad students. Okay, so to summarize. When we want to architect Perl software, we start with a, start with a compelling performance sense of application. If, it, if speeding up isn't going to impress anybody, there's no reason to use parallelism. We get the top level structure and computational elements, and then we go through this sequence to d compose structural and computational patterns to yield a software architecture. Okay? And what I've described to you today is kind of the top of that process. What, this is what produces what we call the, the high-level software architecture. If we had more time and perhaps, you know, Jim and I are discussing in future incarnations of the course, we'll talk about then, you know, I haven't told you how we parallelize any of this, right? You know, that I haven't addressed that. But then we go through and take a particular set of strategies for par parallelizing it from a set of patterns, how we're going to implement it, how we're going to execute it. All these are in expression patterns. This is the layers. This is how many patterns. So you see, in some sense, this is kind of top-heavy. You know, so you've actually seen, you know, uh, over a third of the patterns used in this whole process. Um, you know, I talked about this as a, as a palette. So these are the palette of, of, of um, ways of parallelism. Again, we say if, if, you, if you look at these, these are all the ways to, we claim these are all the ways to parallelize. If you tried them all, then, then, then you've done your duty in terms of exploring that palette. So this is the, the total language. These are the computational patterns coming from the architectural styles. This is my colleague Tim Matson's book, which is revised. And he's spreading that around for review. So if, if, you, if you would want to post and have people in here read portions, you're, or you're welcome. OK. So, so let me just add that we, when people do their class projects, we will strong, and they're going to, and they, if they take an application and paralyze it, we will strongly encourage them to use this sort of approach or at least analyze their right. analysis. From and we'll give you some fully worked out examples that won't make that easier. OK, so, but what, what's the real takeaway here? When say, how could I write all those, or work with my students to write all those uh, papers in all those diverse areas, it's because I took them all back to the computational patterns, right? I didn't have to go deep in the domain expertise so quickly we define these into these patterns. So for me, for a long time, computation has been just like this big monolithic ball of yarn. And these computational patterns help to unravel that big ball of yarn into 13 strands. Um, Alan Kay has this great quote, perfective is worth 100 IQ points. 
You know, and it's really true. I mean, I was saying, if you have the right perspective, that's, that's worth like, you, you see, it seems like you have 100 IQ points more. When I look at computations from, this, from the standpoint of, of these different computational patterns, I really feel like, whereas I was kind of stymied, I don't know, that's a lot of matrices, looks kind of complicated and so forth. Oh, no, okay, Denson and Roger, BLAS2, okay, yeah, we know, we know where to look for the solution to that. So computational patterns make me feel smart. Structural patterns make me feel organized, right? So again, software, you know, I don't know how many of you ever worked on a million lines of software. I actually started my career working at Johnson Space Center on, 100, on over a million lines of software. Without structure, you're just completely stymied by it. But you break it down in manual models at any given time, you're looking at, at a maximum of, say, a thousand lines of code. You know, you can feel like organized. And if the, the structure is such that when I'm looking at this code, I don't need to worry about that code over there, I feel really organized. So even the most complicated application can be broken down into manual modules. So some of you probably want to rush off to class and say, um, uh, the key, I think, to parallel programming is creating a good software architecture, which is a composition of structural patterns, computational patterns, and the orchestration of these creates architectures which facilitates these development of parallel programs. I showed you one. There are two more in the notes. And uh, I, I can give you some more st studies. Here, if you want to look more into patterns, there's a web link. Here, if you want to look more at the research and, and go to the publications on, those, on that one slide I showed you, they can be found there. Those of you who have to rush are welcome to leave. Anybody wants to? <laughs> any of you want to stay and ask questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer. Option pricing? Yeah, actually, I think that's one. I don't think we ever wrote that up, but it's basically just kind of a Black Shoals. Are you familiar with Black Shoals? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's like a Black Shoals like uh, computation done on. Uh, have you heard of the Larrabee processor from Intel? Uh, yeah. It's kind of like the, 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 um, uh, the Tylera processor. You know, it's a, it's a real loosely coupled MIMD processor. Yeah. So that, that we have a bunch of publications on. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's looking at, um, you, you know, you, you can apply, I mean, it's looking at risk in the kind of the big Goldman Sachs portfolio style, but you can, you know, the basic computations can be used in, well, I mean, the idea was to speed it up to the point before, you know, when you do a trade, you can, you can assess the, the, the risk of doing the trade. Are you coming out of the house or are you? Are you coming out of house or are you, are you just interested?